Hello boys and girls, today I want to talk about studio monitors. I want to ask all the simple and stupid questions that I have and that you have sent me. Questions like passive versus active studio monitors, questions like can a monitor be too big for my room, do I need a subwoofer and where should I put the studio monitors in my control room. And the good news is that I'm not alone on this channel today. I have come all the way to Northern Hollywood, I think to the headquarters of Cali Audio to meet this gentleman who is a real studio monitor expert and one of the main designers behind the Cali Audio speakers. So welcome Charles. Yeah! How are you doing? Good. So Good far. To be here. Thank you. And I'm actually really curious to hear your answers. All right. Because like we'll fire away. I think there are a lot of myths, right? In the in this <laughs> in this world, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course there are. But maybe start with with your job here at Cali. All right. So um, I'm one of the founding partners of Cali Audio. Uh, I and a few of my colleagues were working in another company. We decided to start our own company um, back in 2018. My role at Cali is acoustics and system design, and that incorporates everything from the design of the transducers to the waveguides, to the port tubes, to the acoustic integration, to making sure that the entire system comes together. He's the right guy, I told you. The first question, active versus passive monitors. Okay. What's your take on this? All right, so uh, active versus passive monitors, there are advantages and drawbacks to both of them. Um, starting with passive, in some instances, it's not convenient to uh, install AC mains. Mm -hmm. As an example, if you were putting in overheads in, and you had an existing building, you may not want to put uh, wire electricity right. to your overheads. So there's that. Um, acoustically, uh, passive monitors have had their adherence, but in my opinion, Acoustically, active monitors make sense because you can have better control of both the frequency response and the directivity of the monitors. Um, additionally, passive components, if they're not chosen very, very carefully, can add distortion to the system. And isn't it also another advantage that you can have like dedicated amps for each driver? That's correct. When you do that, you have control over both the directivity and the frequency response of the system where your options are limited with a passive network. Passive network, in a classical sense, when you're using a passive network with a regular amplifier, the passive network has to control the frequency response and the directivity of the system. So sometimes the directivity requirements fight against the frequency response. Mm -hmm. What about ported versus sealed? That's how you call them, right? Monitors? Ported versus sealed. Ported provides a lower frequency extension and more um, what's called efficiency bandwidth product mm. uh, of a loudspeaker. But when it does that, it does that at the expense of a higher group delay. What is that? A group delay is the, the delay of which uh, a, a perfect uh, perfect loudspeaker, when the signal goes in, the, the signal goes out, Yeah. right? But in the high pass of a speaker, because all speakers are high pass, you know, it's, they have a, some cutoff frequency at the bottom end, there is um, some additional delay caused by the roll off of okay. the speaker. Um, and so there's, an in, there's a little bit more group delay with a ported loudspeaker. Now, oh, okay. Okay. now consider what we're dealing with. What we're dealing with is a studio monitor that's used by professionals to make decision. So our, our opinion is, is that the additional group delays at the frequency that those group delays occur, which for our product is down, you know, uh, 40s or 50 Hertz, somewhere in that region, is not going to be a distraction that's going, going to cause somebody to make a poor decision, mm -hmm. right? Because and it's so low. Or, because uh, it's lower in frequency. Yeah. And also um, because we have extension that a sealed box loudspeaker wouldn't necessarily have unless you were brute forcing or unless you had a system where you put a lot of amplifier power in. Okay. But that means a sealed system is cleaner because 
you get less of that delay. So if you add maybe a subwoofer or not, no? Okay. It's not necessarily that simple. Okay, so you have two systems. One is a sealed system, one is a ported system. Ported system has more group delay uh, because of the port, but the sealed system, the transducer has to move further. Mm -hmm. And when it moves further, the nonlinear parameters of the loudspeaker, because loudspeakers aren't linear, yeah, yeah, aren't yeah, perfectly yeah. linear, they are nonlinear parameters, uh, they have nonlinearity, is what I'm trying to say, and that those nonlinearities can cause distortion. Ah, okay, so it's, the woofer is moving more. The woofer is moving more. It causes and causes distortion. Exactly. All right. Okay. Okay. What I heard was always that there's a certain frequency, right? The port is tuned Correct. to, Correct. and that that could could be that could be problematic. It's a Helmholtz resonator, and mm. so there is a particular frequency that the port tube is tuned for. But if you get the system design correct. There's no problem. Um, our opinion would be that, no, it's it's fine. It, the, the proof is in the pudding. Um, the, the proof is that you can listen to a system in the bass does not sound sloppy, mm -hmm. right? It, yeah. it doesn't sound bloated. It doesn't sound, um, doesn't sound sloppy. We all know that like getting the phase right is so important, especially between different drivers. That leads mm -hmm. me to the next question. Two versus three versus four, whatever uh, way speakers, the more the better, the more accurate or the more problems or? Yes. It probably depends, right? Uh, I, you know, there are some benefits with going with more transducers yeah. and there are some drawbacks. One of the drawbacks is when you have, and especially when you have uh, systems that are not coincident, in other words, you have a, you have a woofer here and a mid-range here and a tweeter here, is that at each crossover point, um, you have two transducers producing the same frequency, mm -hmm. right? And in space, what that means is that there is going to be places, uh, you know, above and below the design axis normally where the path length differences causes a cancellation. Okay. Okay. And so you get a directivity anomaly. And then, and now that's a problem. So in that case, if you have a non-coincident system, a two-way is probably a really good thing because you only have one, one problematic place. Uh, right. frequency. And then right. so you can, you can make a steeper crossover. Of course, mm -hmm. steeper crossover, then you get more phase reps, but you get a st steeper crossover, but you can minimize the directivity anomaly. And since in, in general, I don't want to say we're we're phase blind, but we're not as sensitive to phase, absolute phase, as many people think. You okay. know, there's there's I'm not going to get into the controversy. And it's frequency where, dependent, right? As well, isn't it? The sure. perception of that, yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. And um, there is a um, there's a controversy whether or not people are you know they can hear the phase of a loudspeaker and whether you make a loudspeaker linear phase versus allowing the crossover to have phase reps, that's an entirely different thing. Uh, just talking about the directivity anomaly though, I'd rather only have one crossover in a, two, in a, in a non-coincident system. Now, if you happen to have a coaxial or coincident system, uh, then you get more options. Hmm. As an example, if you have uh, a mid-range and a tweeter, which are coaxial, mm -hmm. um, then you don't have the directivity anomaly. Yeah. Now you can put the that critical vocal range into a single driver mm -hmm. and that crossover to a tweeter without having any hiccup in the directivity. Okay, okay. Now, by the way, the other thing that happens is that mid-range then becomes the waveguide for your tweeter. But if that waveguide oh, starts moving yeah. around, in other words, if you try to use that as a woofer, well, now you have another problem that's intermodulation distortion. So. Better to have a three-way if yeah. you're going to have a coaxial system. Okay, and then then you can use that that uh, coaxial as a mid-range tweeter, which minimizes the problem. Okay, okay. But there are great sounding three-way systems that are not coaxial, right? Uh, sure. If you have a three-way system, um, it is good if you're in a treated room um, to have absorption in those areas where those uh, cancellations may be pointed. Got That's it. one of the things you could put a cloud above your head as yeah, an example, yeah, yeah. Or you okay. put carpeting or something to, to soak up uh, or, you know, the reflection from underneath you. One question that, that many people came up with was, um, can a loudspeaker be too big for my room? That's what you read a lot. Ah, oh, don't get that one. How, you know, how big is your room? That's going to cause problems. Um, okay. And maybe we're not talking about like getting the, the biggest four by 12 mains into your bedroom, but just like, you know, you know, you know the discussion, right? Yes, I know the discussion. Well, 
The answer depends on the configuration of the system. If I had, let's say, let's say I was in mixing in a 10 by 14 room, let's say, like a bedroom size. Yeah. And I put some giant loudspeakers with, you know, you know, 15 inch woofers and then, uh, you know, a, a, a mid bass woofer separated by 400 millimeters to a mid range. And then, and, you know, the tweeters yeah, uh, way up uh, here oh, and these things are yeah, spread out. Yeah, yeah. Well, you need to get away from that system for everything to come together. Each speaker has a sweet spot, right? Like where, it, where everything lines up correctly, so to say. In or? that configuration, you're going to need to get further away from yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. If you have a system that's configured such as a coaxial, mm -hmm. as we were talking about, less so because course, yeah. everything above 300 is coming from, from a the single same point. Spot. Yeah, right. So it doesn't really matter how big the system is um, because it doesn't need any distance it's, right. you know, to... To, to come together. So it's less sensitive if you have a system like that. Okay, but if we have like common near fields, I mean, nothing really huge, right. they all work in a, in a bedroom size studio, fine. right? Should that should be fine. be fine, yeah, right. Yeah. What about subwoofers? Pros and cons? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so the thing is, is to be able to monitor what you're mixing. Yeah. Right, so what are you mixing? Are you mixing with synths that go down to 20? Are you mixing acoustic instruments uh, that don't go down below 40? Yeah. If you have a monitor that you know uh, goes down to 40 hertz or so, you shouldn't need a subwoofer, again, unless you're mixing something with information yeah. below that. Yeah. Okay, because remember there's drawbacks. There's of course, benefits of and course, drawbacks. Of course. If you use a subwoofer, and let's say you cross it over at 80, just pick a number out of the air. Yeah. Uh, what it does is it will reduce the load on your mains, potentially reducing distortion in the mains. Yeah. But when you have the crossover, you also have phase wraps that are happening. Because you're introducing another, That's we right. just talked about it, right? Another right. crossover point. Right, and with phase wraps, you have, uh, again, you have group delay and you have uh, phase. Now, by phase, Putting aside absolute phase, uh, the issue is is getting, of course, the subwoofer aligned so it, it sums in phase with the mains. Sure. Yeah. And and that's doable. And in a well-integrated subwoofer can sound uh, very good. It is important, comma, however, when you configure your system to be able to listen with the subwoofer in and with the subwoofer out. Mm -hmm. Even if even if you're mixing with something with lower frequencies. Yeah. Because you want to be able to hear what it's going to sound like on systems that sure. are bass limited. Sure. Yeah. My experience is it is, and I'm doing a lot, always have been doing a lot of measurements, and mm -hmm. I think it's difficult to not get some kind of weird behavior at at the crossover point. So I'm I'm mixing without subwoofers. Yeah. And exactly what you explained, I'm doing rock and metal music, and mm -hmm. it's not that low. Yeah. So I have I'm using my Odyssey headphones just for a double check, just mm -hmm. to be sure there's nothing, and I totally get away with it and i don't want a subwoofer that's me follow-up question to the subwoofer you just said yeah cutting the um the lows on the on the mains other people recommend not doing that so what's your take on this well right. the problem is to get the uh, summation without cancellation yeah right Right, because the subwoofer uh the mains will have a roll off at some frequency mm -hmm. and there will be associated phase wraps from the mains and as the phase is wrapping around and the subwoofer has whatever phase it has i mean it could maybe it could work i but yeah, generally would, you recommend to yeah, take, do take a load of the over. of the of the mains and yeah sure 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 uh otherwise you need to you really should measure and if it if it sums correctly great i'm not going to argue with that uh but i would just that would be difficult to get it to come together what are passive radiators you see them more and more i think do the barefoots have them i think the amphions have them right looks like another speaker on the side or the back or something like a passive thing yeah what is it okay so a passive radiator is basically like having another woofer diaphragm mm -hmm. uh but without a motor okay okay and just like a port tube has compliance and mass the passive radiator has compliance and mass so it will form um, a high pass system just like a port tube wheel, but it has it's it's a d different order. In other words, the, the 
the roll-off slope is steeper mm -hmm. and it has a cancellation where the passive radiator is directly anti-phase with regard to the main speaker. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Uh, at a certain frequency only or what or yeah it's a very certain frequency it will it the, the, out the, frequency, that, yeah. the response cancels and then has a very steep roll off because cool. the whole idea is to extend the base range again like a ported Correct. system right yeah okay so now the passivator will even have more group delay than a ported system okay and it is not as efficient as a ported system the efficiency bandwidth product is not as not as good, but it prevents uh, turbulent noise from a port tube. Mm -hmm. Okay, which happens when you crank well, the speakers. It or? happens with a poorly designed port tube. Oh, okay. If you spend, as an example, a sufficient amount of time determining what the proper geometry for a port tube is and implementing that geometry, you shouldn't have to have noisy port tubes. Yeah. Right. And in my opinion, um, a port tube is going to do a better job acoustically. Okay. But now you said a passive radiator introduces some kind of steep uh, cancellation. Well, and it has more group, group delay, so I haven't heard anything positive about it so far. <laughs> well, it, again, it, it prevents noise from a port tube. Which a good port design also... Also it. does. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, well, a passive radiator will never go turbulent yeah right because it's a passive radiator yeah, yeah. but a port tube will always go turbulent at it will always make noise at some output level yeah, the yeah, trick yeah. is to get the port tube to not make noise until the transducer and the amplifier are at the end of their okay. uh, capabilities yeah. that's so, that's the trick with a ported system so passive radiators are just another way of extending Extend another the, way of extending the, the base range all right yeah Next question, amplifier designs. Mm -hmm. I see more and more class D amps in the studio monitor world. So mm -hmm. class D versus analog traditional designs. Well, the first class D studio monitor that I worked on, it was almost apostasy at that point in time mm -hmm. to go class D in a studio monitor. Mm. Uh, yes, there are drawbacks and advantages to both. Uh, the drawback, the primary drawback for the Class D amplifiers has been noise historically. Maybe tell us the difference. Okay, what, what? so uh, an analog amplifier uses transistors to control the output directly. So you get a linear input, you get a linear output, mm -hmm. right? Or a lead, hopefully linear, hopefully linear, you know, um, aside from the nonlinear nonlinearities of the electronics, which are dealt with in several different ways, but um, it's linear in, linear out. A um, class D amplifier is a switch mode amplifier, mm -hmm. and it can have an analog input. But what it does is the devices uh, are either on or off, right? And by controlling the uh, the pulse width uh, that's going to the speaker and then sending that square wave, if you will, through a low pass filter, it becomes the analog. So class D amplifiers are very efficient. Yeah. Lightweight. Lightweight. Uh, it's easy to get a lot of power. But again, historically, you've had issues with uh, noise. You've had issues with the impedance of the load uh, affecting the transfer function of the amplifier. Mm -hmm. uh, but those have, you know, in the last 20 years, there has been great amount of progress and to the point now where there's no quality difference. Yeah. Right now, the class D amplifiers are very, very low noise yeah. to the point at the end of the day, if, if, if you're near field monitoring in a quiet room and you cannot hear the noise coming from your monitors, it's yeah. different. And then it's all uh, harmonic distortion, intermodulation distortion, uh, other factors. Mm. Um, but what's really exciting to me about Class D amplifiers, you can take a signal, you can convert it to digital. Now you can use digital signal processing mm. to have a very, very repeatable equalization for your loudspeakers, mm -hmm. as an example. Mm -hmm. And then 
continue to handle the signal digitally all the way to the amplifier and then it only gets converted back to analog at the output stage yeah yeah digital you can do a lot of fun stuff right yeah. um, like delays eqing even yep. like key audio has some kind of cardioid bass thingy that they somehow do sure, digitally sure, sure. stuff like that right yeah for us it's about um it's about being able to control back to uh directivity versus frequency response if you have control of each amplifier and you're able to individually equalize each transducer mm -hmm. you can get a better result yeah. I mean, you can get a very very tight control of a system uh response that and, leads us back to the very first question active versus passive now mm -hmm. class d so that gives you a lot of options and tools to exactly make the system better right exactly. control things it does right, right. well and so it's all about control <laughs> right next and final question and i think a lot of people ask that in different forms is like where do i put my speakers uh, there's no no easy answer but maybe let's start with should i put them on a on a stand should i put them on my table should i put where do i put them and uh, that next question would be should i put them close to a wall inside the room i have a very short answer and then i have a very long answer the very short answer i'm ready for both very short answer you should put them where they sound the best mm. okay now let's dig into that short answer as a as a loudspeaker designer i really have control about the way the loudspeaker sounds above about 700 hertz mm -hmm. i have very little control about the way it sounds below 700 hertz because that's when the room i'm 700 hertz it could be a little yeah, bit whatever, more yeah, a little yeah. bit less comes but, into play yeah yeah the room comes into play at at some frequency and below that frequency the room is going to do what the room is going to do yeah you the standing wave the standing uh standing waves in the room you know as an example if you're if you're sitting in a cancellation where the room you know has the half wavelength and you've got a cancellation where you're sitting well it doesn't matter how much eq you put in there no. you're never going to be to able hear to anything. hear that frequency right, right, right. um so you really have to spend some time getting your loudspeakers in the same place now if you're monitoring in stereo now you can spend some time listen put the speakers take some material that you know Put the loudspeakers where you'd like them to be. Actually, start with where you'd like the loudspeakers not to be. Mm -hmm. If you start with where you want the loudspeaker to be, you might twist your own arm to keep them there, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. though they don't sound right. Okay. So start with you, where you don't want them to be and listen and move them into several different places and listen and listen. If you can measure, well, that's even better because now you can take a look at what it's doing. There's Room EQ Wizard, there, right? It's that free. Is, exactly. You need an Omni mic. Correct. That's what I've learned. Like I fooled myself many times thinking something was great, but when I started measuring, I actually was like, oh, okay. What? And it's so interesting because for me, that changed so much. Just finding out, like, like understanding your room, like learning the room modes. If I go here, if I go there, it's always some kind of compromise. Yeah. But it, it's for me, it was so much more important to move the speakers compared to any room acoustic treatment mm -hmm. and EQing. Or so. Yeah, we, we advocate the use of REW. It's free, it's openly available. You can use link it. Link below. I mean, yeah. And uh, I'd also like to, prov to provide a link. Uh, I have a paper about a survey of measurement techniques. We advocate moving microphone techniques. Which is very interesting, by the way, yeah. Um, yeah and it's quick and it gives you the right answer yeah um and so, you can also use it to eq if yeah. you have a chance to do that uh where you can calibrate for your room ah okay so it gives you a eq measurement curve that you can put into what? right so it doesn't have a wizard uh but what you can do is you can measure your loudspeakers in a room yeah and obviously you don't want to be eqing cancellations no that makes no sense <laughs> move your right? loudspeakers um, but what you can do is you can pull down peaks and it's pretty simple to do that. They have a pretty, uh, straightforward interface that will allow you to, uh, apply equalization and, and pull down peaks and, and make a lot of a difference if, if that's what you want to do, or if not, look, you can just get your loudspeakers in the right place in the room. Right. Because yeah, get one step back. So what people should do is move, 
move, move, measure, measure move, find the spot measure, that looks can. the most linear yep. in the low end, right? Yeah. I never cared for anything above, let's say, 500 or something. Yeah. Because it didn't wasn't telling me anything. That was something I tried to judge yeah. with my ears. Yeah. And, and it's also like easily like the, whatever treat the early reflection spots. So that's not too difficult to achieve compared to base absorption. Sure, sure, sure. sure. And then below 500, but especially maybe below 200. Mm -hmm. I was just looking for the most linear response. Is that yeah, what I want? Yeah, below about 500. Yeah. I'd be looking for a linear response. You can get things piled up um, anywhere below 700 hertz or so. And uh, yeah, you really want to get them in the right place and spend your time. If you can't measure, it's okay, but but listen. Yeah. And measure if you can yeah. and, and get them in the right place. Now, if you're doing immersive, then that's a little bit more problematic because the loudspeaker locations are pretty set. That, 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 right, a, right. That, that goes a little too far, maybe. Yeah. That, um, but, <laughs> but there's no general recommendation like to put them close to the wall or yep. further away. No, right? Yeah. It's just like find the best spot for the for a linear low end. Exactly, and, exactly. Right, right, do that. What about speaker stands? First of all, something that doesn't buzz or rattle or hum or create a problem, right? Um, some weight to them so they don't bounce around or... or, or Which lowers the self-resonant frequency or whatever you call it? Well, or? again, if it doesn't rattle or buzz or make a sound when you tap on it, it should be fine. Right. Right. A um, lot of those metal, by the way, those metal speaker stands, if you tap them, they, they really, they're an instrument. They sing. It's like, doom, doom. You can well, I got a war story about that. I... <laughs> I, yeah, I was in an area where I was in a, in a place and I was measuring and a speaker stand was literally ringing. Yeah. Yeah. And Terrible. I found it and, and dealt with resonance. And but does, does, that means if I just take a pile or whatever, concrete or just a brick stones, make sure they don't rattle and don't move, something really heavy. There's stands out there. Um, I mean, I'm just saying like something heavy could be, could be any, anything. And then do I have to decouple the speakers from that? There's a lot of talk about decoupling and, and you know, using a, a concrete base and a speaker stand that's filled with, with sand. At the end of the day, if the loudspeaker stand is not sounding like an instrument, mm. you should be just fine. Right. Right. Okay. Heavier is good, but heavy can cost a lot of money. Mm. And not everybody has, you know, more, more money than they spend on loudspeakers to spend on stage. Some of these stands get really expensive. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know that you, we ne necessarily need to complicate it that much. You just need to get a stand that just doesn't resonate. You know, doesn't and, resonate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And loudspeakers should be just fine. Uh, I've made several measurements and you know different decoupling um, solutions. I've never been able to measure any difference between the two. It's not to say that there's no difference there. Or the anything like I just can't measure it. Okay, and and I can't hear a difference. I'm not saying there isn't one at some level but i'm just saying i can't measure it so you don't care <laughs> yeah no I, yeah. it's not that i look it's not that i don't care at the end of the day um our goal you know with what i do is to provide a neutral reference to somebody who's mixing to deliver or to help them be as confident as they can be in doing their work because then they do better creative work right right so i just want to be able to to guide somebody such as that all these things aren't overcomplicated, right? Because when we overcomplicate things, now you got you're thinking about, hmm, I wonder if the stands are doing this. I wonder if this is doing this. I, you know, what is the loudspeaker doing? What is the room doing? Golly, uh, I just want to make things simpler for people so that they can be confident. But then again, that it the whole system depends on the room acoustics. Your speakers only translate. If you get them in the right place in the room. Exactly. Otherwise, so they might sound totally well, wrong. So spend, uh, spend the time, get your loudspeakers in the, in the right place in the room, do the room treatments you need to, but then, you know, be confident that you've done the right thing. Mm. Okay? Don't don't overthink over, it. Overcomplicate things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It needs to translate, right? That's what I've learned. It's like if you... That's, if everything you, is translation. Right. Here's the thing. We build studio monitors. We don't build hi-fi speakers. I mean, they sound great. I like to listen to music on them. But hi-fi is all about, there's, there's, there's a bunch of money on hi-fi. But hi-fi speakers are, are meant to, to, to make things sound pretty. Studio monitors are do, built to do one thing, translate. Yeah. Right? If, if you can send, if you can do work and you can send work out and not get it back, that's the finish line. Right. 
That's a goal. Yeah. Right, right, End right, of story. Right. Yeah. Right. Now that having been said, I prefer to listen to music that I listen to for, you know, when I listen to music, I prefer to listen on studio monitors. Ah, because you always want that something honest. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want an honest loudspeaker and that's pretty much right. what it's all about. Right. I've also never really understood that, that hi-fi thing. I mean, of course you can make more money by selling hi-fi speakers and adding some fancy wood around them or something. I, we all know that. Well, I can make but, a studio monitor look really good too. Right, right. But Maybe but, at some but, point in time. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, but then again, if I if I listen to a great mix on in my studio, it sounds fantastic. Why should I, you know, why should I, uh, you know, I, I don't need anything yeah, that makes things sound. Some hi-fi like, guys will disagree with us. Uh, and that, then sure. that's fine. And But I disagree with a lot of things in the hi-fi world from... <laughs> There are cables that cost more than my speakers, you know, and there are like a lot of weird things in that world. <laughs> but, but then again, yeah. I think you've answered all my questions and all your questions, boys and girls. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So everybody, check out Cali Audio. Check out their wonderful speakers. Leave a comment below. Say hi to Charles. Say thank you. Maybe you have some follow-up questions for another interview. Who knows? But yeah, I'm much smarter than before and I hope you are as well. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Leave a comment. Thanks for watching. I see you in hell, motherfuckers. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Everybody laughs when I say that. It's always good. <laughs>